from the police calling all cars, attention all cars. Be on the lookout for a well-dressed young man, about 25 years of age, medium height, weight about 140 pounds. Has brown hair, brown eyes, ruddy complexion, slight accent, more for passing worthless checks. That's all. Rolls and quit. Gentlemen, the exciting and hazardous duties of your police and fire departments demand that the automotive equipment they use deliver sparkling, dependable performance. When life or death may be a matter of seconds, their gasoline must be good. Instant starting, unlimited power, quick getaway, night and day. That's why so many police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline. Remember, this gasoline is exactly the same as that which you can buy at any Rio Grande service station. Also, Cracked Gasoline has 10 points average higher anti-knock rating than gasolines which are not cracked. If you are now a user of Rio Grande Cracked with tetraethyl, then you know what police performance in the gasoline really means. If you are not, then try a tank full tomorrow and enjoy the performance required by police and fire departments. Rio Grande Crack is sold at all Rio Grande stations. Tonight, Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department has sent as his personal representative, Captain Bert Wallace, Head of the Homicide Squad, who has a personal message for you, Captain Wallace. Uh, good evening, friends. It is the de desire of Chief of Police James E. Davis to give the citizens enjoying these true police dramas diversified programs. Therefore, tonight, you will hear no machine guns or revolvers. You will, instead, hear of a different type of criminal from the more spectacular enemies of society who break the law with guns, knives, and nitroglycerin. Midwinter, 1927. Across the chill Princeton campus, the light in the windows throw swaths of gold on the sparkling white carpet of newly fallen snow. Music is in the air, and the clear laughter of young women tinkles across the quadrangle. It is prom time. From Vassar, from Smith, from Wellesley, and from Park Avenue have come the most beautiful girls in the East. And from Harvard and Yale and Williams have come the coon-coated boys who are fortunate enough to have friends among the Princeton juniors. Among the visitors from other colleges is George Gaber, a Harvard law student, who with his Princeton host, Charlie Wallace, is standing in a secluded part of the ballroom watching the canine tactics of the stag line. 
The two young men seem to be hugely enjoying their own private little joke. <laughs> it's a perfect disguise, George. There isn't a person I've introduced you to that doesn't believe you're really a German baron. Never having seen a German baron, how would they know? Of course, that Rimmer's monocle helped. Uh, no doubt. She'd go a long way to Germany before you'd find a real baron that wore one. Yes, I suppose so. But for Princeton purposes, your monocle, your accent, and your big title of baron, Alfred von Krupp, passes perfectly. You know, as a matter of fact, Charlie, there aren't any von Krupp. Really? Sure. The Krupps, as you know, were famous munitions makers for years and years. Finally, the head of the family died, and there were no male descent. So Wilhelm II arranged a marriage for a favor of his to the woman who was the head of the House of Krupp. And instead of her taking his name, he took her. Well, I'll be done. I never knew that. <laughs> Neither thought there was anyone else, I guess. <laughs> the Americans are woefully ignorant of the Almanac de Gotha. The Almanac de Gotha? Well, what's that? Oh, that's the... Well, you might say the who's who of European nobility. Yeah? Well, if there is such a thing, we'd better not go too far with that little joke. Somebody may check up on you. Who? You never even heard of the Almanac. And if you didn't, you suppose anyone else here has? Well, maybe not. Uh, Surely, I'll raise you. I can pass as the Baron Alfred von Krupp any place in this country and get away from Oh, no, you uh, could Sure I could. I can pull this guy to New York and Newport and Miami, any place, and get away with I'll it. bet you could I know I can. But somebody would be sure to check up on you. Surely, as I said before, if you'll pardon me, you Americans are dumb. Yeah, but just the same... If I can successfully pass as the Baron von Krupp for six months, I tell you what I'll do. I'll be your valet for the next six months. Oh, oh, that's too easy, George. I know you can. But if I get by with it, you'll be my valet for six months. Okay, George. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> the success of George Gaber's impersonation is attested by the amount of newspaper space the gullible press gives him during 1927. He is fated by society wherever it congregates. He makes friends with people in high places. Henry Ford is so taken with the engaging young fellow that he makes him a present of an automobile. George Gaber, alias the Baron von Krupp, is living off the fat of the land and anticipating the services of Charlie as his valet for six months when at a house party on an estate in Delaware, his hostess introduces him to a country. Baron, I'd like to present the Count von Schwarzendorf. Oh, this is the Baron von Krupp. Das freut mich sehr, Sie kennen zu lernen. Ja, excellent. Es ist vielleicht besser, wir sprechen Englisch. Ich glaube nicht, dass unser Gastgeber Deutsch versteht. Ja, ist besser. I take your pardon, madame. It is so German to meet a fellow countryman who naturally falls into the mother's heart. Oh, of course. And I'm sure you two will have much in common. You see, Baron, the Count is in America inspecting our Delaware munition plants for his government. And Count, of course, you know the Baron's family. The Von Krupps who made all those guns in the war. The Von Krupps? Oh, yes, of course, you know. They made the large Emmers or some gun like that. You know, the one the bomb passed. Oh, 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 yes. You come from the Von Krupps of Essen, then, Baron? Uh, yes, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Very interesting, Baron. It has been a pleasure to meet you. Uh... Madame, you said something about the garden. Oh, oh, yes. Come this way, Count. I want you to see my dahlias. Auf Wiedersehen, Baron. Auf Wiedersehen. Madame, what do you know about this fellow? This why, Baron? Uh, why, he has the best of recommendations. What do you mean? He is an imposter. Count, how dare you? He's my guest. I am sorry, Madame, to be so brusque. But this fellow is no Baron. It cannot be. Why not? Because in all the nobility of Europe, there is no foreign crop. Great heavens, are you sure? Positive, madame. Then maybe he's come here to rob me. And he's stolen my jewels. Oh, we must do something, please, now. We must catch please, him. Please, please, quiet. Allow me to handle this matter. There must be no excitement, no disturbance to alarm the guests. I shall call the police and then take the baron for a walk in the garden. When the police arrive... We will transfer him to their automobile, and then you may announce to your guest that the Baron has suddenly been called away. And so, you are relieved of a possibly dangerous man, and your face is safe, and no one the wiser. Oh, Count, you think of everything. <laughs> Thus, 
ignominiously, George Gaber's first impersonation ends in the Newcastle County Workhouse, where he is sentenced to serve nine months. However, after he has been incarcerated three months, immigration authorities deport him as an undesirable alien. Ejected from one country after another, he finally is refused permission to enter his native Hungary on the grounds of having taken out first citizen papers in America. He is no longer entitled to Hungarian citizenship. But this resourceful man without a country manages to procure a birth certificate of a former Harvard classmate and presenting it to the American consul with a story that he lost his passport, manages to get another issue to him in the name of his friend. His wager with Charlie Wallace has taught Gaber how easy it is to live without effort. So he equipped with his falsified passport, he journeys to London, where he prepares to get by on a really royal scale. The telephone is his only ally. Embassy of the United States. I uh, wish you speak to the ambassador, please. Who's calling? This is W.C. Widener of Philadelphia. Just a moment, please. I'm Mr. Widener of Philadelphia calling, sir. Widener of Philadelphia? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sir, I'll talk to him. Hello, Mr. Widener. Hello, Mr. Huff. Never had the pleasure of making your quiz. I presume you know who I am. I certainly have heard of the man who gave that beautiful library to Harvard. Well, that was nothing. Huh. I didn't know you were in town, sir. I hope I shall have the pleasure of entertaining you at the embassy. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Houghton, I'm only in London for a few hours. I leave for Paris tonight. But there is something. What is that, sir? Well, my nephew, Tom Hugh of Richmond, Virginia, is arriving in England sometime tonight. If you could... I will certainly do everything I can to make his stay a pleasant one. I've taken the liberty of telling him to call you when he gets in. Excellent, Mr. Weiner. I'll look after him. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, sir. Have a good trip. That evening, George Gaber registers at the Grosvenor Hotel as Taft Sue and calls the ambassador once more. This is Mr. Houghton speaking. Oh, good evening, sir. Uh, this is Taft Sue. Oh, yes, Mr. Sue. Your uncle told me you'd be arriving. When did you get in? Oh, about an hour ago. Have a good trip. Excellent. Uh, where are you now? I'm staying at the Grosvenor. At the Grover. Uh, you must be my guest at the embassy. Oh, I couldn't think of it, Mr. Hart. But I insist. I promised your uncle I would look after you. Uh, no objection, young man. I'll call for you in half hour at your hotel. Very well, sir. I'll be expecting you. And so George Gaber, alias Taft Sue becomes the guest of the ambassador to the court of St. James. For ten days he is fated, as members of the American colony and the elite of British nobility entertain him at garden parties, polo matches, banquets, and dances. Finally, tiring of England, he enters France by leaving the boat attired in the steward's white coat and carrying his own luggage. And within 24 hours, and by the same telephone technique, he is a guest of the American ambassador in Paris, when he leaves the French capital, he is armed with a warm letter of introduction from the ambassador. Disembarking at Halifax, for fear of another brush with immigration authorities in New York, he motors across the Canadian line to Vermont, stopping at Montpelier, where his letter from the ambassador gains him the hospitality of the governor. A trail of bad checks follows him west across the country, but never catches up with him. In Palo Alto, his ambassador letter gets him invited to the Hoover home for luncheon. The list of prominent people who are bunkoed by this astonishing scapegoat during the next few months would read like a section of who's who. They include governors, university presidents, bankers, politicians, society matrons, army and navy officials. And from each, Gaber manages to wrangle a loan or obtain an endorsement on a bad check. Then he flies the coop without bidding his gullible friends farewell. His junket leads him once more to the West Coast, this time to San Diego, where, posing as Taft to Houghton, son of the ambassador to Great Britain, he is right royally entertained. A in the review of the fleet. <laughs> on the strength of his unimpeachable credentials, and then becoming bored, falls for Los Angeles. The telephone is once more an important piece of his equipment. 
The manager of an exclusive Los Angeles club receives a call one afternoon. Hello. Is this the manager of whom I'm speaking? Yes. I'm secretary of Mr. Tattoo Hope, the Solicitor General of the United States. Yes. I want to reserve a sweet for Mr. Hope. <laughs> An hour later, George calls the manager a second time. Uh, this is Louis B. Mayer speaking. Yes, Mr. Mayer. Uh, Mr. Taft Hutton, Houghton, a very good friend of mine, will arrive in the club shortly. I will consider it a personal favor if you'll take good care of it. We'll be pleased to, sir. Uh, tell him to get in touch with me as soon as he gets in. Yes, Mr. Mayer. Still another call comes to the club in the early evening. This is Mayor Porter speaking. Yes, Your Honor. You're expecting a Mr. Taft to Houghton? Yes, sir. He's reserved a suite. Ah, good, good. Please tell him I've arranged a banquet for him at the Jonathan Club. I will, sir. Ask him to call me as soon as he arrives. Yes, Your Honor. And a half hour later, George Gaber... It is Taft to Houghton, arrives, receives the messages which he has telephoned himself, and is escorted to a luxurious suite by the bowing and scraping manager. Gaber orders the stenographer, and in the presence of the awestruck manager, dictates a letter. Uh, to his honor, Mayor, City Hall, San Diego, California. Uh, dear sir, I wish to express my deep gratitude and appreciation for the courtesies you showed me during my stay in your city. Uh, please also convey my personal thanks to the chief of police for the police escort he so thoughtfully provided me during my visit to San Diego. Uh, I look forward, honored sir, to another visit with you in the very near future. Uh, sincerely, I get that right away now, sir. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Houghton, how do you like your suite, huh? Uh, very comfortable, it will do. It is the best we have. Uh, good. I think I can be very happy here. We'll do everything we can to make your stay a pleasant uh, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, I'll need a car while I'm here. Uh, could you suggest your guest card entitles you to the services of the auto livery next door? The bills are simply added to your account. Uh, they are convenient. Yes, sir. Now, can I do anything else for you? No, I think that's all. Yes, sir. Oh, what a nuisance. What's the trouble, sir? <laughs> I believe I've only about $20 with me, and... The banks are closed at this hour. I wonder if I'll need any money tonight. Allow me, Mr. Houghton. It'll be quite convenient for me to advance you whatever you need. Uh, about how much shall we say? Oh, oh a hundred or so, I suppose. If you'll pardon me, I'll go down to the office and get it right away. Ah, very well. Ah, now I suppose I'll have to get ready for that silly banquet the mayor's giving for me. takes the club for several thousand dollars before polite demands for a payment on account forces him to settle with a bad check and move out. Now compelled to promote the hospitality of newfound friends in Los Angeles, he wangles himself an invitation as a house guest of Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Baldwin. When he leaves their home, he also leaves a rubber check for $50, which Mrs. Baldwin has endorsed for him. Mr. Baldwin, furious, reports the matter to the police. An officer's mouth and Williams at the Bunko detail interview Mr. Baldwin at his home. You know, Mr. Baldwin, you're not the first one that's been caught to this Houghton or whatever his name is. He's a pretty slippery customer. No doubt. But I'm here to tell you I'll stop at nothing to see that fellow behind prison bars. It just burns me up to think how we fell for that story of his that he was trying to escape being served with divorce papers. Then after he eats our food and sleeps in our bed, he takes us for $50. I want him put in jail. And so do a lot of other people. Well, have you any idea who else he knew in town? No, I haven't. But he spent a lot of, a lot of his time at the phone. Always spoke of his deals with his broker and the president of one bank or the vice president of another. Or spent a lot of time at the phone, eh? Yeah. Where is the phone? Over there in that alcove. Mind if I take a look at it? No, oh, go ahead. Uh, whose number is Gladstone 1551, Mr. Baldwin? Well, I don't know. Why? It's written down here on the wall. Written on the wall? Well, if it's written on the wall, that pig did it. 
Mrs. Baldwin or I wouldn't think of writing on the wall. Well, let's play a little game and find out whose number this is. What are you going to do? Get some information from someone, I hope. Listen. Hello? Uh, Gladstone, uh, 1551? Five, five, yes. Uh, let me speak to Mr. Harlan, please. Mr. Harlan? You must have the wrong number. Is this Gladstone 1551? Five, five, yes, but there's no... Well, uh, Mr. Harmon must be there. He gave me that number. Well, there must be some mistake. This is Warren's residence. What is your address, please? Uh, possibly I am mistaken. This is 5755 Tuxedo Drive, but there's no Mr. Harmon here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I must have the wrong number. Get anything? <laughs> yeah, the cinch. The kid that answered the phone told me all I wanted to know. Warren's residence. At 5755 Tuxedo Drive. All right, let's get out there right away. You Mr. Warren? I'm Jack Warren, Jr. What can I do for you? Are you acquainted with a man named Houghton? Oh, am I? I'll say I am. Why? Are you a policeman? That's right, buddy. Well, I was wondering when you'd catch up with him. What do you mean? Well, come on in and sit down. I suppose you want to ask me questions about him. Yeah, we do. Well, I'd come on in. Sit down over there anywhere, on the Davenport. Smoke? Yeah. Thanks. Well, what do you want to know? How long have you known Halton? Just a couple of weeks. And that's two weeks too long. You know what he did? No, but we want to. Well, he got me to go to my dad's bank and endorse a $100 traveler's check for him. The next day, they called up dad and told him the check was a stolen one. I'm not surprised. He's got quite a habit that way. Do you know where he is now? Well, no, but he keeps calling me up and promising to meet me somewhere. But he never shows up. He's liable to call me any time. Good. We'll wait until he does, if you don't mind. Well, not at all. You know, I think there's something funny about the guy. Dad thought so from the first, and after he pulled that check business, I agreed with him. I can't understand, Taft. Why, just the other day he called me up and said he'd left something for me at the Richley Hotel. And I dropped by for it. It was a swell-fitted bag from Bullock. A fitted bag from Bullock, eh? Add Bullock to the list of victims. Well, what do you mean? You don't think he stole it, do you? No, no, not this bird. He wouldn't do anything so crude. He just charged it, but he'll never pay for it. Oh, gee, I don't want the darn thing. If it's stolen property, I'll give it back to you. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's him now. If it is, stall him and give us a chance to hear his voice. Okay. Hello? Hello, Jack. This is Taft. Hello, Taft. Where have you been? Oh, I'm so sorry, Jack. I've been very busy. Tied up with the president of the bank all morning. Well, where are you now? Well, I'm at the hotel, but I'm leaving right away. I'm due down at Santa Monica for the polo game this very minute. Going to stop by. Well, uh, look, Taft, uh, why don't you stop by on your way out to the beach? i got something I want to ask your advice about. Well, I'll try to. Don't wait too long for me. I've got to go now. So long. Goodbye, Taft. Hey, give me that phone. Operator. Operator. Place that call. This is Police Officer Williams, badge 238, speaking from Gladstone 1551. Just one moment, please. I will try to trace it for you. I look here, partner. You stay here with Jack in case this bird comes by, although I doubt if he will. Now get over to the place he's calling from just as soon as... Hello? Yes? The call came from the Richley Hotel. Oh, uh, thank you. Richley Hotel, eh? I'm going right over there. In the meantime, partner, you call them and tell them to detain. In the meantime, partner, you call them and tell them to detain Mr. Houghton until I get there. Can I help you, sir? Oh yes. I'm uh, looking for a man by the name of Houghton who's registered here. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Houghton has just checked out. Here's my card. I'm a police officer. You know where he went? Say, uh, what's the meaning of all this? A little while ago, a man called and said he was a police officer and ordered me to detain Mr. Houghton. And now you come here demanding to see him. Fortunately, Mr. Houghton had already checked out when the first call came. I'll have you know, my good man, that we do not like to have our guests annoyed in this manner. Mr. Houghton is a very fine gentleman. And further, wait a minute, wait a minute, brother. How did Houghton pay his bill? By a check? Of course. Here's his check right here. On the Crocker National Bank of San Francisco. Uh, I thought so. Well, maybe you think Mr. Houghton's a fine gentleman now, but when that check comes back, you may think different. Right. What do you mean? I mean that Mr. Houghton hasn't any account at that bank and that you're out just $64. The stack.
stack of Houghton's bad checks grows higher on Captain Thomason's desk in the Bunko Detail Office. The Hotel Men's Association and the Merchants Protective Association are warned to look out for the man. Maug and Williams develop another angle of the case when they discover that Houghton has been trading on the air-mindedness of young boys, posing as an aeronautical inspector for the Department of Commerce and promising to make them licensed pilots, but in the meantime, using their identification to cash worthless checks. It is this strange desire to impress boys of high school age that proves his undoing. For he is attempting to interest a couple of students at aeronautical school on Slotham Boulevard when his erstwhile host, Mr. Baldwin, drops in to pass the time of day with the head of the school, who's an old friend. Well, Ernie, how's the aviation school business? Yeah, fine and dandy, Bob. How's things by you? <laughs> I can't complain. Life's a little brighter since we got rid of that fake Virginia gentleman who was living off of it. <laughs> that was a funny case. If any, I've laughed over it many times. Well, I'll tell you this much. It was almost worth the 50 bucks he swindled us out of to be rid of him. Yeah, I'll bet it was. Never in my life have I seen a man with more brass nerve than that fellow had it. Ernie. What? There he is. Oh, where? Houghton. There he is, out there in the shop, talking to those two students. Are you sure? Absolutely. Come on, he's not going to get away from me this time. Bunker detail, Morg speaking. Lieutenant, this is Baldwin speaking. Do you remember me, the man who entertained Houghton? Yes, of course I do. Uh, we, we've got our man. You have? Where? Out at the Pacific College of Aviation on Foster. Hurry up out here. You'll bet I will. Right this way, Lieutenant. We've got him locked in his office. You sure he's the right guy? Well, of course I'm sure. No one ever swindled me out of $50 that I couldn't remember the next time I saw him. Uh, just a minute till I unlock the door. There we are. Well, Mr. Houghton, or whatever your name is, you're under arrest, huh? Oh. <laughs> All right. I suppose we dispense with the formalities and get down to brass tacks, or <laughs> rather in this case, handcuffs. Never mind, Lieutenant. So, the game is up, eh, gentlemen? And it's been worth it. I've certainly had one hell of a good time at your expense. <laughs> We voluntarily released our prisoner to federal authorities for prosecution on the charge of impersonating a federal officer. And for this violation of the law, he was sentenced to the federal prison at McNeil Island for two years. At the completion of that term, he was taken to New York, prosecuted for violation of the Passport Act, and sentenced to two more, more years in the federal penitentiary at Atlanta. While this term was served, he was deported to Hungary, and if he ever enters the United States again, he will face prosecution by the government for violation of the immigration law. Thank you, Captain Wallace. <laughs> When you buy Rio Grande cracked gasoline, remember, although good gasoline is essential to the proper performance of your car, the life of your motor depends upon the oil that you use. You all know what petroleum jelly is. You know how thick it is when cold, but how thin and watery when hot. Most all oils contain this petroleum jelly because it is a costly process to remove it. It necessitates chilling the oil down to 60 degrees below zero. Sinclair oils are also de-waxed, removing the gummy properties in crude oil that clog the spaces between the piston and the cylinder wall. Now, you may buy either Sinclair Pennsylvania, made from Pennsylvania's highest priced crude oil at 30 cents a quart, or Sinclair Oakleen, made from mid-continent oldest crude oil at only 25 cents per quart. Remember, Sinclair Opaline is made from mid-continent crude oil, which is much superior to our Western oil. Sold only in tamper-proof, extra major cans at only 25 cents per quart at all Rio Grande stations. Look 
from this police calling all cars, sending all cars, cancellation gas 40, regarding a bunco artist. 